my great honor to introduce to you Dr. Jeffrey Duncan Andrade. Uh, greetings, everyone. Um, thank you for the, wow, it's like being back in my high school classroom. I just got gum on my, <laughs> this is awesome. Wait until my students hear about this one. <laughs> like, you could chew gum at the university? Um, so before, before we jump into the talk, um, it's always hilarious to hear your bio, right? Because you're like, you're hearing it and, and it's like not, really who you are at all, right? But that's part of the bio. But there's some adjustments to the bio that I gotta make. One, um, I have tenure now. So I'm now, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm associate professor, um, which I used to think meant they can't fire me, but now uh, with these budget cuts in Wisconsin, I don't know what it means anymore. Um, and then the second piece is, um, as is often the case in bios, um, what you've done or what you're doing uh, tends to be overstated. Um, I'm not a full-time high school teacher. Um, I'm a full-time university professor and I teach high school in my community in East Oakland every day. Um, these are my high school students. I teach one period of high school English every day. Um, this is them. They're in 10th grade now. Um, they're, they're pleased with this picture because as I've gone around the world doing these talks, I always have a picture of them up to start the talk because they're really the reason why um, I'm so committed to this work. But I had their ninth grade picture up for a long time and I would come back and they'd be like, no, where'd you go? And I'd tell them and they'd be like, no, do you have the new picture up yet? And I'm like, nah, man, I haven't gotten to that. And they're all pissed off because they swore that they didn't look like that anymore. Okay? And I'm like, dude, you look exactly the same, right? And they're like, no, I look. So this is them now. This is them like, I don't know, about a month ago um, in the classroom. And I teach, um, I literally teach my neighbor's children. I live in a 3400 block of East Oakland. I teach at Fremont High School, um, which is you know, right down the street from, from where I live. And um, they want to thank you for bringing me here um, because I had a, a flight this morning. <laughs> okay. Which means they had a sub, and you know what that means. On a Friday, no less, right? Best day to have a sub. Um, <clears throat> so the talk that I'm going to do today um, really emerges from the last 18 years of teaching in, in my community. So uh, I've taught for 18 years in East Oakland, not always at Fremont High. Um, I actually started in middle school um, and, then, and then transitioned to the high school. And so I've been at the high school for 15 years, uh, the high school level for 15 years, but I, I did teach my first three years in middle school and loved it. Um, and the, the talk is really situated around an article that I wrote, as the, as the bio did accurately say, that was published in the Harvard Ed Review um, a couple summers ago. And I was approached by the review and, and asked if I would uh, be willing to contribute a piece on a theme issue that they were doing. And the theme was, um, was really driven around this one question. And the question was, uh, what will be the significance to education of the election of Barack Obama to the presidency of the United States? So. I started thinking about how I wanted to sort of go at this, this question. And I started thinking about how Obama um, suddenly um, centers himself inside of the public discourse, inside of the political public discourse. And he really does that by moving this idea of hope in a very public way. Okay? And the way he, he really starts to drive it is by writing a book. Okay, and you all remember the title of the book? What was the title of the book? Okay, The Audacity of Hope. Now, um, if you've read the article, you know where he got the title. Okay, but at the time, I'm, I'm, I, I really like titles. I think they're really useful, um, and particularly if you're a writer or if you're an artist, right, the significance of a title um, is often quite profound. And so I wanted to understand, like, why, why, this, why does he start to move this kind of idea? Why hope? And as I started um, unpacking where he got the title from, I found out that he actually got the title from Jeremiah Wright. Okay, and for those of you that don't know who Jeremiah Wright is, you do know who Jeremiah Wright is. Jeremiah Wright was Barack Obama's preacher in the south side of Chicago who pops up on YouTube with a stark and I think fairly level-headed critique of the ways in which U.S. public policy, not only current but, but, but historically, should be questioned and challenged. 
Okay? And so when, when uh, Jeremiah Wright puts this critique out about um, U.S. imperialist public policy, um, suddenly Obama radically distances himself from the brother. Right? And, and I found that really interesting because the very sermon that causes Obama to distance himself from Reverend Wright, the title of that sermon was The Audacity to Hope. Okay? And so it was the title of the sermon that causes Obama to distance himself from Brother Wright that actually puts Obama into the center of the discourse by operationalizing this idea of hope with his book. Okay? So I thought, okay, let me see how Obama is talking about hope. Right? And, then, and then I thought, I started thinking about um, the ways in which hope was oftentimes a, a, an underlying theme of my own home. I'm the youngest of seven children, and I was raised in a house where we uh, mostly were broke, but never knew it, right? So we didn't have a lot of money, but it never really felt like that. It always felt like we were going to be all right. And, and, and in the worst of those moments when I was coming up, at the sort of low points in my family, in my neighborhood, that my mother was always pushing this idea of hope. Okay? It seemed to always be an undercurrent of the message, not only from my home, right, but from our broader culture. Right? So, so I wanted to understand that component of hope. And then third, I started thinking about um, my own upbringing as, as a young person and how much hip-hop influenced the way that I thought, the way that I interacted with the world, and how much hip-hop really began to move this idea of hope in urban communities, right? And, and, and for those of you who are like, huh, hip-hop, hope, don't, don't mix up rap and hip-hop, okay? They're not the same thing. Okay. Hip-hop is a very distinctive culture that is situated in justice and hope. Okay. Very different from the culture of corporate rap that, we, that we're now beginning to associate with hip-hop. So I was raised on hip-hop, which very much had a, a component of hope. And one of the people who really influenced me coming out of hip-hop was Tupac Shakur. Right. who moved this idea, perhaps the most profound metaphor I've heard to describe the work that we do in urban classrooms, which is this idea of growing roses in the concrete. Okay. And when you think about gr literally growing a rose in the concrete, right, perhaps the most important nutrient in that process is hope. I mean, you have to be fundamentally hopeful to think that you're going to grow something out of the concrete, especially a rose. Okay? And so what I wanted to do was to sort of get this holy trinity, if you will, this, and for the doc students in here, triangulating right? <laughs> these three ideas of hope okay? from a presidential version of hope okay? to a mother's version of hope to a street preacher's version of hope and try to understand what does it mean to try and bring those uh, narratives of hope together hey, inside of a conversation about what it is that we are doing in schools and what it is that's possible for us to do in schools. So I'm going to start with Pac. And, and he, um, Pac, for those of you that don't know, Tupac Shakur wrote a book of poetry. And the title of the book of poetry is The Rose That Grows From Concrete. Okay. And it was that, it's also a poem in the book. And he actually laid that poem down on, on several tracks where he reads it over a beat. Okay. And perhaps the most famous one is from a song that he does called Mom is Just a Little Girl. Okay. So I'm going um, to play you a clip from that song where Pac actually reads the poem over the beat for, for, for Mom is Just a Little Girl. Okay, now, no matter where you come down on Tupac Shakur, okay, let me be clear with you about this. I don't idolize anybody. Cornel West says, no, but, no one free of spot or wrinkle. Okay? So I am critical of Pac 
And I am critical of some of the ideas that he put forward that's, that not only affected me, but that still affect the young people that I work with in a negative way, right? But I have traveled the world working with young people. And I will tell you in no uncertain terms that no one, no one in modernity has had a deeper and more lasting impact on young people around the globe than Tupac Shakur. And the fact that educators are not looking there while they know that kids are in, in, increasingly disinvesting in school baffles me. Because young people invest in Pac by choice. So there's something there, and as an educator, I wanted to understand what was it about Pac's message that seems to resonate across all these boundaries that educators can't seem to cross. He works across race. He works across gender. He works across class. Pac has been dead since 1996. Go to any elementary school and ask kids if they know who Tupac is. Ask kids if they listen to Tupac, and the answer will be yes, regardless of race, class, gender, neighborhood, or geography. I, I, I've been to New Zealand on multiple occasions to work in the Maori community. And the first time I went there, this was like eight years ago, first time I go there, the first thing that these Maori kids, the Maori are the indigenous people of New Zealand, the first thing that the Maori kids ask me is, you're from Oakland? I'm like, yeah, that, you know Tupac? <laughs> I'm like, nah, dude, not everybody from Oakland knows Tupac. It's not, it's not like that, right? <laughs> hey, all the way across the world, right? And for me, as a researcher and as an educator, it is incumbent upon me not to like Tupac or not like Tupac, but to understand what is it about his message that seems to resonate so profoundly with young people, and how can I incorporate that message into the way I think about my teaching. Now, Pac talks about young people growing up in poverty, young people growing up amidst the racism and, and, and the violence of urban communities as roses growing in concrete, okay? Now, it's such a powerful metaphor for me because when you think about it, when you think about a rose growing in concrete, concrete as a metaphor for the conditions of poverty and urban life in this country, right? suggests that you're, you're growing up in an environment that is devoid of all the key resources to grow in a healthy way. It's devoid of, of, of the nutrients in the soil because the, the concrete and the chemicals in the concrete toxify the soil. It's devoid of sunlight because the concrete blocks out the light. It's devoid of water because the concrete siphons off the water. All the nutrients you need okay, are few and far between. They're hard to come by when you're in the concrete. And indeed, that's what the research bears out. Now, I was telling, and I got I, I to gotta thank, you always thank the people who, my mom told me there's three people you never piss off. Okay? The first group of people you never piss off is people who cook your food. <laughs> okay? And keep, the, I mean, in, in, in California, watch out. Keep coming up with these, with these policies, excluding the people that are preparing our food and see what happens to your food supply. Okay. Two, never mess with the people who are handling your money. Okay. And three, never mess with the people who are giving you rides. Okay. So I want to acknowledge right, Susie and Chris for giving me a ride from the airport. Okay. I forgot to do that, it's my bad. Okay. And they gave me some water, I hope it's okay. Because <laughs> I didn't even have some. So, there's actually um, a study that came out that changed. I was telling them on the ride over that I've stopped reading in our field. Okay? Not completely, but I don't read much in the field of education anymore. Because frankly, we're not moving anything that is particularly inspiring to me around what we need to be doing in schools. We're tinkering around the edges when the system has been broken for close to a century now. Okay? 
And, but when you start looking in other fields, right, they're radically rethinking the ways in which they're approaching problems, in part because of the way that new technologies are changing the way that we understand the body. Right? So I'm reading less and less in education. And most of my reading now is in public health, social epidemiology, the medical field. New England Journal of Medicine is a regular read for me. Right? Because what I'm trying to understand more and more is what are the conditions that are affecting the young people that I'm working with before they even get into my room. Because if I don't understand that, it doesn't matter what my curriculum is because it's not going to connect to the material conditions of their life. Right? And indeed, more and more fields are starting to look at these things in really profound ways that should be driving the discourse in education. Now, one of the places you can start if you don't have the, the tremendous amount of free time that, that I have <laughs> is, is here. Okay? Check out a film series PBS put out a, a couple years ago called Unnatural Causes. It's like six, six or seven parts of the series. They have an amazing website, has tons of resources for teachers. I know teachers all over the country that are pulling stuff off this website. And, Unnatural Causes is a global study of this question. Is inequality making us sick? Answer? Yes. yes. Okay. The, 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 the research data on this is very conclusive. That the leading cause of poor health around the globe is inequality. It is the biggest threat to health and well-being. So any health policy that really wants to move health health and well-being needs to address this, okay? Now, <clears throat> this study is really clear about what the concrete is, okay? And the list is long. In fact, it's so long that it runs down to the second screen, which is not projecting anymore, and it's actually down in the basement. And I can't cover all the bullets that they cover in this series. So I highlighted a few that I think are particularly important for our field to be talking about. Right? And I can't even go into all of them because the research around these is so powerful and so complex. But what I will tell you is, is that all of these bullets up here have very conclusive research on the impact of these social toxins on the health and well-being of people, particularly young people, and the ways in which it affects not only their health and their well-being, but their preparedness for school. Okay? Now, in my community, in East Oakland, one of the biggest challenges we have is around physical violence. Okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you on a little journey inside of my community real quick. In 2006, the San Francisco Chronicle decided that the, the homicide rate in Oakland was so troubling that they wanted to sort of like uh, uh, run a shock and awe campaign. Right, we're going to let people really see just how violent this community has become. Okay? And so in 2006, they launched this website. And they said that we had um, the plague. Everybody see that? Wow, this is like, I've never been in a room with a back projector and a green screen that can actually block my laser beam. I don't know what that means. <laughs> But for real, like, watch, I got a laser beam, watch me lose it. Yeah, that's deep. I'm a social scientist. I don't know what the hell that means, but I'm sure a scientist in here could tell you what's going on. So they said we had the plague, right? Which I find particularly interesting as somebody who lives in East Oakland. Because if we had the plague in Oakland, y'all would be in trouble. Huh? Because the funny thing about the plague is it's non-discriminatory. The plague does not recognize race, class, gender, or arbitrary political boundaries. Now, if you look at a map of that city, this is a five-year total of the homicides. Right? Now, I wish my little pointer worked, but since it doesn't, if you look at this map, right? now you don't have to be a topographer to see the anomaly. What's the anomaly on that map? Anybody see an island in the middle of our city? If the red, the red dots here on the edges are the city borders, anybody see a topographical anomaly on there? What is it? 
Piedmont. Look at Piedmont. Right? Now, Piedmont is a city inside of our city. There is no way into Piedmont or out of Piedmont without dealing with us. You've got to come through the town to get to Piedmont. Even if you fly in a chopper, you've got to come through our airspace. Okay? So what the hell is going on in Piedmont where you can literally avoid the plague? They have literally opted out of the plague okay? because we don't have the plague. Okay? That's not what's going on at all. Right? This is not some kind of random social phenomenon or some uncontrollable disease that has struck our city. Okay? This is the concrete. And what you'll notice about where the concrete is unfolding, it's in this gray area between the two freeways, the 580 and the 880. Okay? It's called the flatlands, also known as the lower bottoms. That's where I live. Above the freeway is called the hills. Okay? Now, is there anybody here from the bay? Okay, if you're from the bay, you can't answer this question, right? <laughs> so all you non-bay heads, who lives in Piedmont? How y'all know that? You, you ain't from Piedmont? You ain't from the bay? Did you do some kind of survey before you came to figure out? No. How do you know who lives in Piedmont? Because we live in a racist, classist society, and that's how you know. That if, if you are looking at a safe community, everybody already knows that it's white and wealthy. And who lives in the flatlands? Okay? Poor and working class, mostly people of color. And it ain't all people of color. It's some white folks in, in the flatlands too, and they getting treated just like folks of color in the flatlands. Okay? So it's not always about race, and race is always a component. We're going to deal with that in a minute. But if you think it's just about race, head to the Appalachians, where there is multi-generational entrenched white poverty. And their schools, not the business. Okay. Well, in 2006, the Tribune gave up, or excuse me, the Chronicle gave up. So the Oakland Tribune picked up the work. And in 2007, they started publishing a homicide map on the front page of the Oakland Tribune, our newspaper, once a year, where they put the names, the places, and the faces of everybody who was shot in our community and killed. So that's 2007. 2008. 2009. And I haven't had time to add 2010. So I decided I'd up, update the map. Now, how many years is a child in our community in public schools? 13, K to 12. This is eight years. So they have just reached middle school. And you show me where any child can live in the flatlands that has not personally witnessed homicide, if not multiple homicides. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. As Cornel West says, Pharaoh's on both sides of the Red Sea for people from my community. And what are they cutting from schools? Counselors. What are they cutting from schools? Health programs. What are they cutting from schools? PE. What are they cutting from schools? Art. All the things that we know through strong scientific research are the key to dealing with trauma. But it's a, all in the name of rigor, all in the name of raised test scores. Okay? And my commentary always to principals, teachers, and superintendents is this. How's that going for you? <laughs> okay? Because you're ignoring an entire, a massive set of research data which says that if you don't deal with this, guess what you ain't going to get? Test scores. Now, what the research is saying about exposure to this kind of traumatic violence okay, is that it is causing rates of PTSD in urban youth and high rates. Okay? Now, the problem with the conversation around PTSD is when people hear PTSD, most people think of this guy. Right? They think of the soldier. Now, there's a book that y'all need to read. 
if you're, if, if you're trying to confront these issues and how we prepare our curriculum and our pedagogy to deal with this, you need to read a book by a guy named Bruce Perry. He wrote a book called um, The Boy That Was Raised as a Dog. Right. Now, Bruce Perry, does anybody know where we got the, the diagnosis for, for PTSD? You know, Okay, most people think that, right? Which is an important set of exclusions. So there was actually, right, a holy trinity of groups of people that comes together to get PTSD onto the list of diagnoses. Prior to PTSD, it was not a medical diagnosis. It was a social phenomenon, and what was it called? It was called shell shock. Right? So they knew if you go to war, they knew if you go and you experience these traumatic events, it's going to mess with your head. Okay? Now, I don't know how many of you in here have ever witnessed a homicide. I have. And let me tell you that I can tell you, as somebody who has witnessed that kind of trauma, that you can't control when it fucks with you. Okay? That there are triggers that you don't understand. There are triggers that mess with me. Sometimes it happens when I'm giving a talk. And something will trigger just the way somebody moves, a sound, whatever. And I will completely lose my train of thought. I'll just go dumb blank. Now I'm 39 years old with my PhD from Berkeley and my whole professional career is about studying this shit. About understanding it. And I can't even deal with it well. So how do you think that goes for an 8-year-old, or a 10-year-old, or a 15-year-old? Not well. Okay. Now, this diagnosis comes in the 80s as a, partially as a result of soldiers that had returned from Vietnam and could not reintegrate themselves effectively into society. Okay. And so they're like, man, there is something serious going on here. But there were two other groups that joined the fight to get this diagnosis. Okay, better women specifically, right, feminist groups that were gathering resources around rape, post-rape trauma, okay? And then the third group, anybody? It was a, a Jewish group that was getting folks together to get a medical diagnosis for former um, uh, Jewish folks that were incarcerated during the Nazi uh, Holocaust, okay? And they were looking specifically at long-term internment and how that creates traumatic injury to the brain. Okay? And that's one of the reasons why you supposedly in prisons, and if you spend any time in prisons, you know that this is not true either, but supposedly they don't have those kinds of solitary confinement, intense solitary confinements anymore, in large part because of this research. Okay? Because it actually causes traumatic injury to the brain. So these three groups get together and they force the medical community to come up with a diagnosis. Okay? Now, these are the symptoms that are actually in the DSM for the diagnosis for PTSD. Now I want you to look at those symptoms and then I want you to think about schools and I want you to think about the most common diagnosis in schools for kids who experience traumatic stress. ADD, ADHD, they are almost mirror images. And what Bruce Perry says is that he estimates that somewhere around 60% of the medical diagnoses in schools for black and brown children in urban communities for ADD and ADHD are medical misdiagnoses. And the reason this is happening is because that in 1980, when this diagnosis comes out, the prevailing logic was, from the medical community, was that young people can't get PTSD. Any guesses on why they would say that? Well, they're not gathered by adults. It's adults. They're not been in war, and they're not Holocaust survivors. Okay, but even the kids that had been battered, even the kids who had been raped, right, can't get it. Maturity. Okay. What do you mean? Um, they haven't reached that puberty of emotional connectedness to their surroundings. Right. And specifically what they said was, the term that they used was young people have bounce back. Oh, 
They're more elastic. They're more resilient. Okay? They recover better. So Bruce Perry comes out of medical school in the 90s when this is the prevailing logic. And he starts working with young people who had experienced severe trauma. Okay? And he's like, this is, this is totally wrong. These young people have PTSD. Right? And he says, so, and right around this time, there's a new technology that starts to develop where they can scan the brain. Okay? Prior to this, right, all the brain research was done on who? Dead people. Okay? And how useful is brain research on somebody whose brain is dead? Right? A little bit useful. But now they can scan the brain while you're alive. Okay? And they can actually see which parts of the brain light up under different stimuli. Right? And what Bruce Perry found is, is that not only are young people susceptible to PTSD, they're more susceptible. They are more susceptible because now what, what, what brain researchers will tell you is that in the last 10 years they have learned more about the brain and how it operates than they've known for the last 100 years combined. Perhaps no field accepting technology because of Apple right, has had greater advances in the last 10 years than, than, the, brain, than the field on brain research. Okay. And what field could possibly be more important for educators than brain research? And yet, right, we're not accessing it all. We don't know what the most cutting edge findings are. Okay. And what they said is, is that PTSD in young people, or people generally, feeds on avoidance. It gets worse the more you avoid it, the more you avoid the trauma. So if you have a kid who's been traumatized and gets diagnosed with ADD and ADHD and then gets medicated to repress those symptoms, you are literally killing that child. And the medical field says that in no uncertain terms. It's not debated. Okay? It's, it's, it's not up for argument. It's a medical fact. Right? And indeed, that's what we see in my community all the time. These are my students. And we are burying another one of my students, 15 years old. That's me behind the camera. They had to miss second period for this. In 18 years of teaching in the town, not one year has passed where I've not buried at least one student. And I buried one earlier this year. It doesn't show up on those maps yet because I don't have 2010. 16 years old, shot seven times in the middle of the street. His best friend was in my class. Guess where his best friend is right now? Locked up. Okay. That's the reality that we're dealing with before we start conversations about test scores. There is a, so what, what, what the researchers are now saying is, is that PTSD doesn't even capture it. It's the wrong diagnosis, even for these kids. Because PTSD was meant for people who experienced a trauma and exited the trauma. Soldiers leave the battlefield. Our kids go home to it. So PTSD is not, because PTSD stands for what? Post-traumatic. So it is PTSD, but it's prolonged. It's prolonged exposure to traumatic stress, okay? And the new research on the brain and trauma is moving that direction. So Harvard just released a study this year, a few months ago, where they have started actually documenting what they call complex PTSD, CPTSD. They're now trying to move that onto the DSM, an official medical diagnosis to say that you don't have PTSD, you have complex PTSD, which is repeated um, trauma. And what they've said about soldiers, okay, what they know about PTSD, and what they know about urban youth is this, okay, that one in three urban youth has mild to severe PTSD, one in three. And then they took that data and they took it to the military. And they said, what's your data? And when they mashed up the numbers, what they found is that urban youth are twice as likely to experience PTSD as soldiers returning from Iraq. 
twice as likely. And when a soldier that you know has been in war nuts up on you, do you send him to the office? <laughs> do you expel him? No, what do you do? You get him help. Why? Because he's been traumatized. And that's what you do with people who've been traumatized. But we do the opposite with kids, particularly the poorer they are and the darker skinned they are. Okay? That we punish the trauma. And what does that do to the trauma? Okay? It exacerbates it. Right? So we're actually making our own problem worse in the way that we respond in schools because we're ignorant to the most cutting edge research about what's happening in kids' bodies and what actually works to resolve that issue. Right? This is the concrete. This is what Tupac's talking about. These are the conditions in which young people are being asked to grow. And even if you have a kid that has not been traumatized, one in three, y'all, what does that mean for that kid in that class? That they're probably sitting next to somebody who has. And the other thing we know about trauma is it is socially transmitted. That my trauma becomes your trauma. Okay? That's what it means to be in a community. Okay? And no space in a community is quite as small and quite as tight-knit as a classroom. I could go on. Okay? That was just violence. There is equally compelling research about racism, about gentrification, what Mindy fully love at Columbia University's medical school calls root shock. So she came up with a medical term to actually describe the process of gentrifying neighborhoods. Um, poverty, patriarchy, institutional violence, all of these things have very clear health and medical impacts on young people's minds and bodies that are affecting how well they're going to do in school. And as Pac said, this concrete causes damaged petals. According to um, the Harvard School of Public Health, the biggest threat to health is the accumulation of multiple negative stressors without the resources to cope. Let me say that again. The accumulation of multiple negative stressors without the resources to cope. Who does that describe? Yeah. The poorest kids in our country is the group that is the most likely to be exposed to multiple stressors and to not have the resources to cope. And what the medical field says is that this actually increases what they call the allostatic load. Okay. Fancy term for this. This is straight out of a medical journal. On the top. No, <laughs> I'm going to draw on your board. <laughs> so on the top, right up there, the top one, what you see is a normal stress reaction. Okay? And so you see um, on the x-axis, you see time. On the y-axis, you see the physiological response. And there's a stress moment that happens. Okay? And your body responds. Everybody's body. I don't care who your parents are. I don't care how many degrees you have. When it comes to the stress response system, everybody reacts the same. Okay? Now what happens is, if somebody were to come in here right now, in this door, okay, and just step in a door and just let off, just whop, 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 three into the ceiling, Okay? Every one of you in this room would stop taking notes. Okay? That is a biological fact. You wouldn't be like, description of persons. Right? <laughs> Clearly from Oakland, 5 foot 11, wearing blue shirt. Okay? Thought he came here to give lecture. Okay? What would happen is, is that your, your, what we know now from the brain research, what we learned in the last 10 years, is that there are basically four parts to your brain. Okay? And they develop sequentially. The frontal cortex okay, is, is, and they're not sure exactly when you get into your frontal cortex. There's some range and discussion. Um, they, they say probably somewhere around your early to mid 20s. So, some of you, frontal cortex, critical thinking. Okay, faculty, okay, do what you want with that. But they, <laughs> they may not be there yet, so don't get pissed off at them. It's not their fault. The brain is still developing. Okay. And all the way at the back, at the stem, okay, this is what develops at birth. Okay. And this is your stress response mechanism. 
That's how you survive as a baby. That's how you know to cry. Right? That's how you know how to communicate even though you don't have words yet. It's your stress response system kicks in. Right? Now, if I came off and let off, if, if someone came in here and let off, everybody would shut down four, three, and two. Okay? Two is your motor skills. Three is your emotional skills. Four is your critical thinking. One, in section one of your brain, you have three options. Anybody know what it is? F cubed. Fight, flight, freeze. Everyone in here would have three options and three options only in that moment. You would flee, you would attack, or you would freeze. Okay. okay. Yeah, that'd be flight. She's like, I just dropped to the ground. Okay. Me, I probably be hurtling people, right? <laughs> I'm well schooled in that. <laughs> so that's, that's that moment right there where you see it says stress and that dot. And what do you see under um, physiological response on the graph? Right? It shoots up, right? And those are a set of chemicals that include things like adrenaline and a specific chemical that the medical field has become especially interested in called cortisol. Okay? And your body's going to produce, it's going to shoot through your bloodstream all of these chemicals and adrenaline in order for you to respond. Okay? A heightened response. And in the process, of sh that's how it shuts down the rest of your brain. Okay? And that's why you hear these stories about people who under extreme duress might literally be able to lift a car off somebody. Because you are literally physically stronger, faster in those high stress moments because that's how your body is able to survive. Right? Now, in the process, right, what, and, and this is how you know this is what's happening, okay? If you are, if you're feeling that moment, okay, what do you feel right here? Okay, and how, how does it beat? It's pounding, right? And that's, that's your body's stress response. It is pumping more blood so that you can respond more effectively, all right? Now, once you get to that peak and you get out of this stress moment, the person is disarmed, we escape. Come on in, y'all. Just check in. I was like, whoa, what's going on in Chapman? No less. Were, were y'all were were, were in here? They're they, allies. Did, did they even know what, what we're talking about right now? Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, you heard? We've been down there. Okay, okay. Y'all okay. don't want to come in? I feel a little, we you know, I'm from East Oakland, so that's, that's kind of weird when you got people behind. <laughs> I might have to start talking over here with my, with my eraser. <laughs> so, um, so what happens is, right, your body hits this kind of pinnacle, right, and you, you, you emerge out of the stress moment, whatever that is, right? Either the person's disarmed or, or we get out of here, whatever. And then what starts to happen? For, for me, the way I like to describe this is, because of who I am and where I'm from, it's how I feel when a cop pulls up behind me. Okay. When, when a cop pulls up behind me, I'm, I'm pounding, right? And I'm like, oh shit, blinker, blinker, no, no blinkers, hazard lights, brakes, start. <laughs> pull over, right? Go ahead, fucker, take me, I, here's my license. Here's. Okay, and my, <laughs> and, then, and then that fool turns off, right? And then what happens to my heart? Okay. After he turns off, it calms back down. yeah. How does it calm down? Slowly. 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 Okay. And that's what they call recovery, right? So it's not instantaneous back to level. It's slowly, 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 slowly. And you're like, whoa, man, ducked one there because I was riding dirty. I had bad tags. Okay. okay. That's normal stress. Okay. And all you students in here right now who are like, I knew it. These professors are killing me. They're stressing me out. Okay. Don't take the bait. Y'all know the research. Right? What the research says is that is actually good for your body. Sorry, grad students. Okay. Yeah, when they push you and they're like, no, you don't get to sleep tonight, fool. That draft is terrible. Okay. That's actually good for your body. Okay. Sorry. 
But not all stress is good for your body. Okay? That's a normal stress situation. All right? But what our young people are experiencing is something more along the lines of these four. Okay? So I like to, um, with the top left one, right? the way I like to describe this to teachers is, um, and just pretend the graph is right here. Okay, is first period, second period, third period, fourth period, fifth period, sixth period. Okay, that's what they're experiencing. Now, what do you notice about the slope on that graph? It's very steep. Okay, and that's what kills you because you have you don't have a steady increase in cortisol and adrenaline. You have a sharp increase, and then what about the backside? No recovery time. Okay? It's just right back out of your body, and then you're right back into it, and you're right back out of it. Okay? That's multiple hitters. Right? <clears throat> and then I see this one a lot in my kids. This, the, the bottom one, the prolonged response. Where you have a kid who is living in one of those neighborhoods that I showed you earlier. Okay? And let's say he's in my class in 10th grade. And the night before, his best friend gets popped seven times in the middle of the street. And he comes to my class, first period, the next day. Okay? And he comes in, and he's that kid. He's, I like to refer to him as Little Willie. Y'all know your Little Willie? That kid who gives you homicidal thoughts? Okay, that one keeps you up late, late at night, all the time, that little Willie, and little Willie comes in, and little Willie once again doesn't have his backpack, and little, little Willie once again hasn't done his homework, and little Willie once again is coming in late, and you've had it, because you're strung out too. You on one of these stress cycles as well as a teacher, and you say, that's it. Man, I'm t man how many times, bruh? How many times are you going to come in here and not have your homework done? How many times are you going to come in here and not have your backpack? How many times are you going to come here and not go to the office? Okay. And so he moves over a dot. And then he goes to the office. And what's the principal say to little Willie? How many times are you going to get sent in here? How many different teachers are going to have to get before you get it through your head? That's it. We call in home and you catch in three days call home over another dot and then what's mom say are you outside your mind you know what just happened to your cousin last night you know what our family's going through right now and you gonna pull this shit on me wait till your ass get home over another dot and then he goes home and what happens hmm? ass whooping if he was in my house you catching one over another dot. And then where's he go? Because home is hostile. Back out on the streets. Okay. And he dies. And this is the problem with stress. And this is why this research is so important. Because it doesn't show out here. Okay. It's showing inside the body where you can't see it. Right? Now, the thing that is so powerful about the research is that it says, at any of those dots, me, when he came to first period, the principal, when he got sent to the office, mom, when he got sent home, could have ruptured the cycle and broken the pattern. Okay? What the research says in, with total clarity is the key to interrupting toxic stress is caring adults. No pill, <laughs> no test. Caring adults, that's the X factor. That's the most important protective factor. And the more caring adults you have around you, the more people who don't intervene in that way. Why are you here again doing this, but instead actually takes the time to say, what's going on? Or maybe you actually live in the neighborhood where you work, and you're like, yo, hug, right? Let's go for a walk, whatever. Okay? Different responses create different effects in the body. And indeed, the medical research bears that out as well. One of the most important researchers for us to study is a woman named Arlene Geronimus, who is uh, at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor School of Public Health. And Arlene's work, if you don't have time to read all her stuff and it's you know, super scientific with all kind of graphs or whatever, just pick up this copy of Miller McCune 
where they summarize her research in very accessible ways. And her research looks specifically at the toxic health impact of racism. And this is the trip that, that you've got this, this whole conversation about a post-racial society. Talk to the medical field. <laughs> And they will laugh in your face because they, what they will say is the research in the medical field is crystal clear on the fact that we have severe racial problems in this society and it is killing people. The medical field will say, okay, if we're in a post-racial society, explain this to me. How come black men are the only group in the history of the industrialized world to have a declining life expectancy? It can't just be gun violence. More people get killed from car accidents than gun violence. Okay. There's something else going on in this society that is affecting people of color in toxic ways. Okay. And indeed, that's what her research shows. She calls it weathering. And what she says is, here's what the medical research suggests, that most babies, when they are born into this world, are born as like a state-of-the-art house. Okay. They've got a state-of-the-art roof, they've got a state-of-the-art foundation, they've got a state-of-the-art uh, uh, siding, they're good. And then they're born into a racist, classist, patriarchal, yes, brothers in the room, the research is also very clear at the ways in which women's health is impacted by patriarchy. Okay. And what happens is you're born into this society and if you are poor and you are non-white, you are born into what she describes as inclement weather. In other words, it's raining and it's snowing and it's sleet and it's high wind and it's desert heat every day. And of course, you're a state-of-the-art house. So what happens early on when the rain is battering you? Not much, right? You deflect it, you deflect it, you deflect it. But over time, what happens to your roof? It weathers, okay? And as the roof weathers, because you don't have protective factors in your life to come and repair the roof, eventually that roof starts to crack. And when your roof cracks and you're still in inclement weather, the rain, the sleet, the heat starts to come in through that crack. And it literally kills you from the inside out. And that's why this is so dangerous. Because as a teacher, you can't see what's going on inside a kid's body. And if you don't know this research and you don't know how to read the signs, then you misread it. And you misread it as misbehavior. You misread it as a kid being bad. You misread it as a kid coming from some kind of home or some kind of community that just doesn't belong in this classroom. Okay? And it's a total misread. And the thing that pisses me off is that we passed federal policy that said that that's against the law. You remember that federal policy called NCLB? Remember that? No child left behind? No child left behind? Bush gave us the key. We had an out. And we put it in the wrong damn lock. It said in No Child Left Behind, nothing is to be used in schools that is not supported by direct, quote, rigorous scientific research. And our asses were too damn lazy to go find the rigorous scientific research that would actually support the position that we've been arguing for from the left for a long time. But it's there. It's there. You don't even have to dig very far. It's there. The research is totally behind the kinds of Paulo Freire and critical pedagogy, et cetera, et cetera. But the problem is the research isn't there in our field, right? You got to go start looking elsewhere. But these, and the funny thing is, these fields are, are really well respected, okay, in D.C. Now, we'll see once we start pulling this out how much respect these folks actually have after that. But at least we got to test the waters. <laughs> <laughs> So, my mom, my, this is hella funny because this is going to be on iTunes. So, my mom, she, she's recently discovered email, okay? And so, I get all these four, you know, my mom's, you know, she's a, a, a Chicana, you know, hardcore Catholic, so I get all these forwards about how Jesus is doing and, you know, <laughs> and, and key points of the year, right? I'm reminded. And um, so, my mom... Um, th th through email has then discovered YouTube, 
because people can send her these links, right? And then it's simple, I just click on, boop, browser opens up. And so I did this talk at Harvard uh, maybe six months ago. And, um, and so somebody sends my mom this link. And so she's all juiced, like my baby boy, he's at Harvard, blah, blah, blah. She goes on, she look, and she watches the talk, and then, and then she calls me right after the talk. And I'm like, Ma, what's up? And she's like, I just watched your talk at Harvard. I was like, yeah, Ma, what'd you think? She goes, I think you curse too much. <laughs> I'm like, Ma, I was at Harvard. Can I get a little dap first, then the, then the critique? Right? Now, but the cool thing about my mom is, is that she still hasn't figured out how to text message. <laughs> now, if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. It's not, it's not important. Okay? But the thing I like about the medical research is this, that it would say, uh, no, you're not. Actually, there's, there's some pretty clear research about the fact that we're not screwed. That despite all these toxins that young people are experiencing, there are very clear solutions, very clear actions that people can take in schools okay, and in the broader community that actually matter for health and well-being and as a result matter for achievement over time. Okay? And what the medical field is saying is, is that hope is maybe the most important protective factor for young people that are living in the concrete. That's literally what they say. The term hope is literally what they are trying to measure right now. Okay? Now, I like hope. I like the term because I'm a literature teacher. And hope is a dynamic word because hope is both a noun and a verb, which means it's both a thing and an action. Okay? It both lives and it's something you have to do. In the research, it's popping up all over the place. So you have Charles Snyder's work in psychology, where he's moving this idea of hope theory. He's actually got something that we've been fooling around with in, in our community in East Oakland called the Children's Hope Scale. Um, you've got uh, uh, a good friend of mine, Lynn Syme, who's a, um, a professor, presidential professor of public health at U in UC Berkeley School of Public Health. And he has the best definition. He's a social epidemiologist. He has what I think is the best definition of hope for educators. He defines hope as a sense of control of destiny. And in fact, Gallup's student poll last year, that's what they measured. The National Polling Agency decides they want to measure hope in adolescence. But of course, hope is not new. Just because the research community has suddenly stumbled upon it doesn't mean it hasn't been with us all along. In fact, across cultures, in literature, lore, folklore, fable, legend, music, art, hope is omnipresent. The concept of hope. Okay? So the Mayan people had uh, a saying, in la quech, okay, which translates into the Spanish, tu eres mi otro yo, which translates into the English, you are my other self. Okay? Quintessentially hopeful that when I look at you, when I look at you, when I look at you, I see myself. You are a mirror image of me. Okay? This is the driving principle, the core foundation on which the Tucson Unified School District Rasa Studies Program is based upon. That principle. And what is Arizona trying to do with them? Eliminate them. Okay? And of course, in Sandra Cisneros' The House on Mongo Street, right? Her, her lead protagonist, what's her name? Esperanza, which means? Okay. And you want to go to the, to the Europeans? OK, Pandora's box. Okay. The last thing in Pandora's box, hope. When Pandora realizes what's happening, she slams the box shut. And according to the myth, the only thing left inside is hope. So our job as educators is to pry that box back open and to release hope back into our communities that need it the most, particularly with young people. Okay? Now, as I say in the piece, all hope ain't good hope. Right? We have a saying in dominoes. Anybody here play dominoes? 
Okay, you play dominoes, right? And you know the saying, all money ain't good money. Right, so you got that person who's just so happy to scratch and get on the board, ah, and they get down five points, and the person come right after them, get 15 off, right? And you're like, come on, dude. You can't count? You didn't know that was going to, okay, never mind. Okay. All money ain't good money. All hope ain't good hope. There are forms of false hope that I see peddled in schools all the time that I think teachers need to avoid and educators need to avoid. Right? And I'm not going to go into these today to sort of break them down for you, but the article discusses them quite clearly and gives you some very concrete examples of the kind of hope you want to avoid. I want to spend the rest of our time uh, in this discussion today focusing on what works, critical hope. Right. Now, the thing that I found in, in my research into critical hope is that the, the, the forms of false hope can operate independently of each other. The forms of critical hope are interdependent. Okay? So they are a triangle. And if you kick out one leg of a pyramid, what happens? It falls, right? So you need all three of these. Now, the first of these is what I call material hope. Okay. And this begins with high quality teachers. For all those folks in here who are trained to be teachers, understand this. The single most important resource you can bring to our community is good teaching. You are so valuable when you are a good teacher in a community that does not have a lot of good teachers. Now, that won't be enough. You're going to also have to dig into your pocket sometimes. You're going to have to feed the hungry and clothe the people who don't have clothes on their back and find homes for the kids that are homeless. You're going to have to give kids rides home. You can't ask a kid to stay after school, watch the sun go down, then have them walk out of your classroom, and, and you jump in your whip, and you drive over to your nice, safe little neighborhood, and meanwhile, that kid has to cross three gang lines on a bus to get home. How many times do you think they're going to stay for after school tutoring? One. When they come out the room, and they're like walking to your car, and you like not opening that side of the door. And they're like, I'm done, right? I mean, for real, like, what is more important, your chemistry score or your life, right? And if you ain't from the neighborhood, if you don't understand that neighborhood, then you don't understand that. So walk home with them. And when you drive a kid home, please drive a kid home. But when you drive them home, don't be like, okay, see you tomorrow. Park the car, get your damn ass out, and walk up to the house. Meet the parent. Meet the grandparent. I don't speak Spanish. The kid does. <laughs> Have them translate, right? And ain't no language barrier here. Pleasure to meet you. <laughs> Feel me? Like, that's, that's international, right? That's international. That's international. That's international. OK? But you just drop my, because you don't want to get out and walk up three flights in the projects. You grow with the degree. How do you think it feels for a 14-year-old to have to walk up there by themselves? Okay? And kids start to read that. That's material hope. It's material hope when a kid comes to your class and you know damn well that kid is on free lunch. You ever had to eat free lunch? That shit was great to me when I was in elementary school because it was sloppy joes and tater tots. Okay? But after a while, when we got to high school and it wasn't sloppy and, the, and the, the lunch people weren't cool anymore and it was this nasty ass pizza with those little square ass pepperonis on them, right? I know who was on free lunch in here because they're all going, yep, I remember that shit. I remember that, I remember that, I remember that, all right? Okay, you know that that kid is on free lunch and you sitting there with your fat ass foot long subway and you know that kid has been staring at that subway sandwich the whole class period, hungry as hell and you don't offer it up. Okay? There's a real calculus that goes on in that kid's head about what resources you're willing to share. But if you're that teacher, it's like I'll go hungry before you do. He go, have my subway. And I'll be like, oh wow, thanks dog. You want a little? Knowing full well that they don't really want to give you half back, but they will since it's your sandwich after all. Okay? Those are the kind of material resources now, you're not going to be able to give them all. You're not a medical doctor. You don't have any extra apartments lying around on your teacher's salary. Okay? 
but you have got to find the resources in the community to track that kid. Oh, that's deep. Ooh, I knocked the lights out. Bet that I'm, I'm the first speaker at Chapman that's ever done that. You get that on camera? I was like, Ack. So you, you, but there are lawyers in the community that you can connect to as a teacher. There are doctors in the community. There are dentists in the community. There are optometrists in the community. And you got to have your little Excel spreadsheet where you see a kid. Look at your kids. Look at the kid who's always sitting like that. And the kid that's always sitting like that has a toothache. Okay? I'm not saying you do, bro, because sometimes, right? And he's like, actually, I fucking do, man. I fucking Chapman doesn't give me any dental services. Okay? And you got to read, right? And when you see that kid, look at a kid, how they eat. They're always eating on one side of their mouth. Okay? And part of the reason why I know a lot of this stuff is because I was that kid. I was that kid. And with those teachers that were like, why are you only eating on one side of your mouth? Right? Why are you always grimacing? Right? Why are you always squinting when you're sitting there? Right? With that teacher, I was much more willing to engage in the homework, to engage in the lessons, to take the lecture, right? because I knew where it was really coming from. It wasn't from a teacher stance. It was from an I care about you stance. And this is what closes the gap between the concrete and what you need to rise up in the concrete. That's what creates the crack in the concrete. You're not going to get rid of the concrete today, but you can create cracks. And through cracks, you can get water. Through cracks, you can get light. Through cracks, you can get healthy soil. Through cracks, you can grow. But we've always known this. This, again, back to No Child Left Behind, this shit pisses me off. 1943, Abraham Maslow releases the hierarchy of needs. 1943, 60 years to process it. And what Maslow says in no uncertain terms is if you don't have what's below the line, the base of your hierarchy of needs, if any of that is under threat, okay, biologically, your body will not allow you to get into these upper areas with any stability because you'll climb back down here, cobble your resources to make sure that those four are stable. And which group of young people most have food, clothing, shelter, and safety under threat. The kids who do the worst in school. Shocking. Okay? We're just playing games right now in the way we're trying to improve educational achievement. And everybody knows it. Everybody knows we're playing games. And at what point as a profession are we going to stop playing games? I'm not playing games anymore. This is life and death. Okay? And the research is clear. And the really trippy part is, look at the top of Maslow's hierarchy. The top of that pyramid, the highest development that a human being can get is the precondition for sustained academic success. We all know the kids that do the best are the kids that self-actualize. And it's biologically impossible for any child who has these things under threat to stay there for any extended period of time. And if you've taught for any period of time, you know the kid I'm talking about. You know the kid that like, just hell of invests in your class and is doing amazing things and all of a sudden disappears. No longer turns in work. Totally disinvested. The reason why is very logical. It's because something in this hierarchy got under attack. And his biological instinct, or her biological instinct, is to regress back down and get that stable before they jump back up into those places where we want them to be. You want a kid to invest in your class? Create spaces that are stable for them. The second kind of critical hope is what I call Socratic hope. Okay? Another term I borrow from Cornell West. He calls it a Socratic sensibility. Okay, and Wes says that young people don't want to hear a sermon. They want to see one. They don't care what teachers say. They want to see how teachers are living their life. Okay? And the question is, are we willing to sacrifice 
as much as teachers, as we are willing to ask our kids to sacrifice to be good students, can we meet them there? And can we lead the way there? It is totally unfair to ask the person with the least amount of power to make a greater sacrifice. It is even more unfair to ask the person with the least amount of power to make a greater sacrifice first. If you sacrifice, then I'll teach you. If you really sacrifice to be in my class, then I'll be a kick-ass teacher. Doesn't work that way, okay? It works in the inverse. Right? And unfortunately, it doesn't always work on a convenient time schedule the way we like, where you show up on the first day and you're just badass. And then every kid is like, I'm in. Okay. It doesn't work that way. Right? You gotta keep being badass. Okay? And then eventually, right, more and more of them really start to buy in because they know this is this is legit and it's gonna last. Now the way I think about this is by thinking about my mom. Because when I was 15, I did not like my mom. Because my mother used to make me do things that I frankly did not think I should have to do. Like clean my room or take a shower. <laughs> and I used to come home from practice, right? Sophomore, too cool for school, come in with my, my bag, dump my bag down, and I'd get rid of it, sit down, and my mom would be like, boy, I'm gonna take a shower, you stink. And I'd be like, dang, mom, could I have a second? Could I maybe just pause for a minute and take a deep inhale, mid rant? And mind you, I'm the youngest of seven, so I felt it was my privilege and my you know, entitlement to rant all the time about everything that was going wrong in my youngest child life. And my mom would stop me mid rant, and she would say, boy, I don't care if you like me, because I love you, and I'm going to be in your life forever. You stink. Go take a shower. <laughs> and I go, you know, and I, when I and I go and I go take a shower. And in that moment, I did not like my mother, but I always loved her because I knew that she loved me. Right. And what I find is is that so many teachers that work in our communities are outsiders to our community, and they know they're outsiders, and so they play the role. And when you are an outsider to a community, you are conflict averse. You dodge conflict because you know you're the outsider. Right? And because of that, so many teachers that come into our schools try to be liked. Right? And if you are liked, you will never be loved. Because to be loved means to be unpopular sometimes. To be loved means to be able to be the adult in the room. And to be loved means to be able to do that because I love you. I frankly don't care if you like me because I'm going to be in your life forever because I live right there, fool. <laughs> I'm not going to watch you walking around these streets when you're 19 thinking to myself, damn, I should have said something when he was 12. Okay? That's the difference between how moms react to what they're seeing with kids and how teachers react to what they're seeing with kids. And as Socrates said, to be Socratic means to be willing to take great risks. All great undertakings are risky. And he added, and as they say, what is worthwhile is always difficult. So to engage in that kind of hope means to take incredible risks with young people and to be okay with that because I'm going to still be standing here if this risk goes ass up or not. I'm still going to be here. I'm going to take another risk tomorrow. The third kind of critical hope is what I call audacious hope. Now, Carl Jung wrote about legitimate suffering. And he said that all society, or all, all, all people, right, have in effect uh, a form of suffering, a set, a set of, of, of sufferings that they must endure by virtue of the fact that they're a human being. And that suffering is equally distributed throughout the population at birth. Everyone gets 10 suffering chips. Okay? And he says the problem is that in, in many Western societies, what has begun to happen is that some people have figured out that they can transfer those chips onto other people. That with enough wealth and enough power, 
and enough military. I can take the chips which were given to me by virtue of the fact that I am a human being and I can dump those chips onto somebody else. But he says that suffering is a zero-sum game which means that those chips are going to have to be carried by somebody else. They're not just going to go away because you bought your way out of them, Piedmont. Somebody's going to have to carry that suffering that you've used your wealth to loop yourself out of. Okay? And that is what he calls unearned suffering. And that is what I believe the concrete is. It is unearned. It is no fault of any child, the neighborhood that they're born into. It is no fault of any child, the society that they're born into. And if they are asked to suffer extra because of that, that is a morally bankrupt society. Okay? That is a society that must fix its moral compass. That because of who your parents are, somehow you are more deserving of a better life. That society will not hold. And all you got to do is study history to figure that out. And this is what Lisa Delpit means. Y'all read Lisa Delpit's work? Yes, no, okay. She wrote a book called Other People's Children. She says that's the problem. Is you got so many folks working with young people that are suffering and they see them as other people's children. And other people's children can suffer. Other people's children can fail. But what if it's your kid? What if it's, what if it's in La Quech? What if it's Tu Eres Mi Otro Yo? What if you are me? Can you see yourself in your neighbor? Can you see yourself in that child that gives you homicidal thoughts? That's the challenge. Now, the way we think about this in our work is thinking about meta and micro ecosystems. So this concrete that I'm talking about is a meta ecosystem. And the fact of the matter is that we're not going to get rid of it today. Racism's not going to end today. Poverty's not going to end today. Drug abuse is not going to end today. Police violence is not going to end today. Th th those are going to be there. Okay? So let them go. Deal with your locus of control, your classroom. And your classroom is a micro ecosystem inside of this meta ecosystem. Right? Now, the way I think about it is, again, back to the medical field. There's a woman named Camera Jones, black woman who's a medical doctor on faculty at uh, Columbia in their medical school. And she wrote, she wrote this piece in a medical journal that she called The Gardener's Tale. And she says that she went, uh, she, she had just been hired uh, as, as faculty, and her and her husband bought a brownstone. And they're, um, they're going up, uh, they're, they're walking up the stairs of the brownstone on their first sort of trip officially to the house that they had bought. And they get to the top of the stairs and they look to the right. And to the right of the staircase, just below the window at the entrance, is a flower box. She turns to her husband and she says, that should be our first project. Because that's going to be the first thing that people see when they walk up to my house. Okay? And as any brilliant husband would say, great idea. <laughs> So that weekend, hey, they, um, they head off to the nursery and they buy, some, they buy a, a bag of potting soil and they buy a, a packet of seeds. They come back and, and, and she gets ready to dump the potting soil into the, 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 the uh, flower box and she looks inside and she realizes there's a partition. And so it's split in half and on one side there's already soil. So she takes the new soil and she dumps it in the side that's empty. And then she takes the packet of seeds and she splits it in half and she takes half in the side that already had soil and half with the fresh soil and she kneads it in. And over the course of the next several weeks, she pays particular attention to this flower box making sure it gets plenty of light, plenty of water. And she says what she discovers over the next several weeks is one of her most important discoveries as a medical doctor. Because what she sees is, is in the side with the, the new soil, is that the flowers grow up, all of them, to full height, vibrant colors, and they create space for each other to grow. And on the side where the soil was already there, she realizes that that soil was old, and it had lost a lot of its nutrients, and it was rocky. And so many of the flowers didn't grow at all. Some only grew to middling height. Only a few grew to full height. And they crowded each other for the few resources that were available. And she says what she realized in that unknowing experiment 
was how much place matters. Okay. Now you can't control the broader flower garden in which young people are growing, but you can control your classroom. You can control that micro ecosystem. You can control the soil that you put down for those young people to grow in when they're in that space with you. You can control the water, you can tr control the light. You can control that. The minute you're ready to give up control of that, get out. Get out of the profession because you've given up everything. So you might as well just be a robot in there. Right? Now, the problem is when you become a gardener is that gardeners, the ones that aren't masters, not the master gardener, the gardener, the gardener sees weeds. And as my colleague Wayne Yang at the University of California, San Diego School of Ethnic Studies says, there are no weeds. He was a long time teacher with me in East Oakland, science teacher, phenomenal. Right? What he used to say is that every year when I get a roster, I am clear about the fact that every child on that roster is indigenous to my classroom. Now if every child is indigenous to your flower box, and you're, you're running an ecosystem, a micro ecosystem, but an ecosystem nonetheless, and that child is indigenous to your ecosystem. What happens in an ecosystem when you start plucking out indigenous plants because you think they're weeds? It destroys the ecosystem. And that's the part we don't get. You see, we try to rationalize getting the kid out who's slowing down the learning for everybody else, the weed. But the research doesn't bear that out. Indeed, what the research bears out is in the classroom where expulsion or removal is a regular practice, test scores go down. Because what happens is all those kids grew up with that weed. And every year, every teacher has seen that same kid as a weed. And you just another in a long line of folks who see this kid as a weed. But you see, he ain't no weed because I live next door to him. And I know what goes down in his house. And I know how fucked up his life is. And I know what his, life, his walk to school is every day. And I'm looking for something bigger than me. I'm looking for a classroom finally where a teacher is like, you're not, throw, you're not somebody I'm going to throw away. You're a rose. You're a rose growing in concrete. And you see, when you're that kid that's the apple of the eye of the teacher, you don't evaluate the teacher based on how they treat you. You evaluate the teacher based on how they treat little Willie. Because you know if you ever have an off day, you can't trust that teacher. Because if you have an off day, you to the curb just like Willie. But if you're that teacher that's like, it's all right, Willie. I'm going to love you anyway. And you better do your damn homework, cousin, because I'm coming through the house tonight to make sure. Then that kid right there who's like, yep, that's a teacher I can count on. When I got a problem, I know where I need to go. And that's the kid who starts really investing in that flower garden. And because that kid's got a little extra resources, they're able to kick some of that extra resource to Willie. Okay? And that's what most teachers don't understand. Most teachers think that they want a te that kids want a teacher that will throw the bad kids out and really teach the good kids. But kids' logic is, ain't no bad kids. It's just some kids going through some shit. Okay? And can you rise above that classic binary bad good kid, bad good student? Right? and be that teacher who's going to teach everybody because everybody is indigenous to this classroom. You want to pull that off? You better be audacious. Okay? You better have so much damn hope that it's seeping out your pores. It's dripping out your ears. Okay? It's enough for everybody plus some extra to go around just in case you run out. To do this, you have, it's painful, y'all, to stare down that path again and again and to, to, to deliver on that project every day and still have Willie come back to your class the next day and tell you where you can go. <laughs> and to not pull the trigger on him like, dude, that's it! Be like, all right, dog, I still love you. You're an asshole, but I still love you. <laughs> Can you rise above the teen drama, right? Or are you going to get sucked down into it? That's what it means to be audacious, to take that journey again and again and again and to make all this progress with a kid and then have them fall back off and be like, that's all right, and go back and get him again and again and again. Perhaps nobody hey, in our recent memory 
has done this as effectively in writing as this person. And I think that her description of this kind of pedagogy is what my colleague at San Francisco State, Sean Jenright, refers to as um, radical healing. The great teaching in this context is a form of healing. Hope in this context is a form of healing. So rather than me sort of narrate the ways in which Maya thinks about this, I'm going to go ahead and let her speak for herself in the way that she thinks about this Hey, this kind of practice as a form of healing. Alex Hills was doing his movie, Toilet Justice, and he asked, would I uh, come out to Los Angeles and do a cameo? I walked out of my trailer that morning, and there was one young man cursing like You could see the blue come out of his mouth. And then he and another fellow, they were at each other's throat. They had each other's clothes. So I went up to one young man and I said, excuse me, may I speak to you? He said, I wouldn't give a I said, I understand that. But may I speak to you for a minute? He said, it's these look I said, huh? I, I've heard that before. <laughs> but do you know how important you are? Do you know that our people slept in many spoon fashion? in the filthy houses of slave ships, in their own and in each other's excrement and urine and menstrual flow so that you can live 200 years later. Do you know that? Do you know that our people stood on auction blocks so that you could live? He said, I know the answer. When's the last time anyone told you how I'm a job? And he started to, to, the tears started to come out. I had no Kleenex or anything, so I just wiped his face with my hands and talked to him. And Miss Janet Dyson came. She said, Angela, I don't believe you actually talked to Tupac Shakur. So I didn't know Tupac Shakur. I didn't know six pack. <laughs> I didn't know the name. Because it, in my life and my age group, you understand? It just didn't, I didn't know that. To past mother wrote me a letter. She said her son had called her right after I had spoken to her. And she wanted to thank me. She said, you may have saved his life. And I thank you, Dr. Angela. In that one story, she painted a more human picture of him than the entire media did during his career, you know. People were afraid of Tupac, by the media man like he was a scary thing. And, and she talked about him like he was a young man in a, a confusing and difficult situation. And that's kind of what I like about Dr. Angelo. Because I know I'm not perfect and, and whatever, but it's something that she, she can look at me and she kind of, she can kind of put the picture together. She knows I'm just a, a dude trying to figure it out. Each of us has a chance to be somebody. And it's my delight that you would ask for me so that I could have the pleasure, the joy, the thrill of talking to you so that I can be somebody. That's a master pedagogue. Now, <clears throat> There's a couple things I want to point out about what she said. First, when she steps out of her trailer and she sees that fight about to jump off, okay, and she intervenes, what is Pac's response? Right. He's not feeling her. Right. Guy pushes back. What's her response? Go again. What does he do? Pushes back. What does she do? Goes again. What does he do? Three times. Right? Now, why would she do this? Maya Angelou, at this point, is a grandmother. And mind you, she's not intervening in, in Tupac's life, is she? 
How do you know she's not intervening in Tupac's life? She doesn't even know Tupac. She doesn't even know Six Pack. Okay? So she, don't, don't get that image in your head where it's like, oh no, it's Tupac. Stop it, Tupac. Okay? That's not what happened. Right? Here's this grandma on a movie set. World famous author. Steps out. Two young men about to fight. Hell no. Break it up. What? No, 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 no. Do you know how important you are? Makes a thug weep. You want to end violence in schools? Bring in some grandmas. <laughs> Let the grandmas run the hallway. Go ahead and fight. Go ahead and fight. Because then I'm going to kick your ass. Right? That's what my grandma would have said. Right? You think that's going to be bad. Mm. So go ahead. Right? Why does she do that? Tu eres mi otro yo. You are my other self because if I don't do this, I'm, if I don't do this, I'm dead anyway. I'm already dead. If I can look at my own sons about to fight, because see, she didn't see two 18-year-old brothers about to fight. She saw her own children. She saw her own self. Okay. Can we meet that challenge as teachers to see every kid as our own child? Right. Now, the second thing I want to point out is when she's with him. Right. Her other child, right? <laughs> Woo! You, you got to see the whole interview, right? Check it out. It's, it's on uh, Sundance's um, Icono class. They spent a whole Dave Chappelle and Maya Angelou together for a whole day. Wow, that was deep. Right? And they have some deep conversation. But I love what she says at the end. Right? What does she do at the end? She thanks him. She thanks him for making her somebody. Because she recognizes, tu eres ni otro yo. Right? That I am nobody without my reflection. I am nobody without you. And thank you right, for choosing me. Right? That's master pedagogy. That's not going to show up in your state test. Right? That's not going to show up in your curriculum. Because okay? that's the sermon that you live. It's not the sermon that you preach. Now, <clears throat> Pac said right before he died, we might not, or he said, he said specifically, I might not change the world, but I guarantee you I will influence the mind that does. Three months later, he was dead. Now, that's kind of how I think about our work. I don't think I'm going to change the world in P7 at Fremont High School on 47th and High Street. But I do believe that those kids I work with will. Right? Now, Maya says that after that happened, where she intervened with the fight with Pac, that Pac's mother contacts her. And what does Pac's mother say? You saved his life. Now, I, we don't know if that's true or not, but I would guess that the man's mother would probably be the best judge of whether or not that's actually true. Okay. Now, that was 1993. Poetic Justice comes out in 93. <clears throat> in 2003, Pac dies in 96. He dies three years later. In 2003, um, Pac, Pac releases an album, Post Mortem, from work that he had done before he died. Okay, so it's work that he does between 1993 and 1996. As a result of Maya Angelou saving his life, he's able to do this work. This album comes out in 2003. In 2009, one of my homies was in Kathmandu at one of the largest Buddhist shrines in the world. And she sees this. She's standing behind them. And she's like, oh, damn, i got to take this picture. So she snaps this picture and emails it to me. This young brother right here is wearing the T-shirt from the Pac album that came out in 2003 as a result of the fact that Pac doesn't die in 1993 during that fight. And this young brother right here has his arm around his younger brother whose hand is on his head because he is weeping. And their youngest brother is learning. And that's the problem with teaching. 
is you can't measure it. You don't know where the ripple effect is going to occur. Sometimes it happens all the way across the world. And maybe you're lucky enough to have someone snap a photo and remind you to intervene again in the next fight because it saves lives all the way around the world. That's what hope does. Okay? Hope reverberates. And that's the problem with teaching is you'll never really know the impact that you're having on those kids' lives, y'all. You'll never know. And most of you will leave too early. You'll get in there and you'll do two, three years and you'll be like, this is too damn hard and I don't think I'm making enough difference. Stay the course. Believe in those young people. Believe in the rose. Because when you do, 10 years later, they come back. And it's always that kid that you thought you didn't get a single inch with that comes back and is like, yo, I heard everything you said. I just wasn't in a place right now to be able to use it. Okay? Now, the problem with Pox metaphor, which is the, the sort of the, 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 the final piece that I want you to take away from this, the problem with Pox metaphor is it's still wrestling with the narrative of rugged individualism, the single rose, okay? And we have to change that. I was the rose that grew in concrete. And they, they, they came along and they see me in the concrete and they're like, <gasps> a rose in the concrete. That's not right. As so they came over, right, and they're like, rose. And what do you do with the rose in the concrete? You pluck it and you transfer it over to the rose garden. So they plucked me up out of the concrete and they transferred me over to the rose garden known as UC Berkeley. And they dropped me down. And they're like, there you go, rose. Don't you feel so much better about yourself now? Because now you're with the other roses. And low key, I did. I was like, yeah, this is kind of cool. Right? Low key, I do feel like a rose. Low key, I do kind of like the rose garden. And then I flunked all my classes. Freshman year. Flunked them all. Because I was a rose of a different color. And everybody was telling me I was a rose and I wanted to feel like a rose, but I wasn't quite like a rose, like those other roses in the rose garden. And once I figured that out, I realized that my job in the rose garden was different than those roses. That my job in the rose garden was to take back the master gardener knowledge that had been taken from my community. So I started, and I realized Berkeley had some of that stuff. They had some books, and I started getting that knowledge. And they had some soil, and I started filling my pockets. And they had some light, and I took some of that light and stuck it in my back pocket. And they had some water, and I shoved some of that stuff in my boot. And when I got out of there, I went back to the concrete. And the good thing about growing up in the concrete is the city's always damn slow to fill in the cracks. So when I came back four years later, back to some concrete, cracks were still there. So I jumped down on the concrete, and I dumped out my boot with some water, and I dumped out my back pockets with some soil and some light, and I started trying to share some of that knowledge about how to grow roses and move from this notion of the individual rose who gets out and then gets to the rose garden and is like, thank God I'm in the rose garden. I don't have to deal with the concrete anymore. That can't be the message that we give to our kids. It can't be. The message has to be, you getting out of this rose garden right now, and as Sandra Cisnero says in the house on Mungo Street, sometimes you have to go away to come back. That's esperanza. That's hope. So the message for, that you give to young people cannot be, look, if you do this well enough, you can escape the concrete. No, 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 no. If you do this well enough, you can change the concrete. And when roses come back to the concrete, they become rose gardens. That's how we're going to change these communities everybody says they're so concerned about, okay? is by cultivating the roses that are already growing there and creating a pathway for them to come back, to drill back down in the concrete and start growing more roses. Who better qualified to grow a rose in a concrete than a rose that grew in the concrete? Thank you.